Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, here to talk about Cities 2.0 and the City of Welland and the important puzzle piece that I represent, which is the recreational waterway. Get our technology working. A little quick background on, before I can go to Cities 2.0, we have to talk about what Welland was. And William Ross this morning with the horse-drawn carriage talks about that period that started a long time ago. But for Welland, we were bustling. Welland is an incredible community. And through its heyday, uh, at one point, Welland ranked highest in the nation, or across the nation, one of the highest rankings in median income. Welland was a bustling, thriving municipality, filled with people with energy, a vitality. The way forward was there. They were living it. Population doubling, growing repeatedly, until it peaked in 1971 at 45,000 people approximately. Industry. Page Hersey, Welland Tubes, John Deere, Atlas Steels, Henninges, the Cotton Mills, Wabasso, factory after factory, all industrial based, all single minded, produce, output, and then it began to slip away. And what do you do when it begins to slip away? The global economy is changing, the needs of the world are changing. What do you do? We've gone to moved out. We've gone to torn down. We've gone to shut down. Welland has, uh, has suffered its share of losses, there's no doubt. We are that city 1.0, that rust town. And although there was many industries, there's no question about it, thriving, thriving municipality. And there are many industries. We're no different than the coal mining town when the coal mine shuts down. The city dies. We're no different than the lumber mill, the sawmill town, the single industry. We had many, but when they all leave, many leave. I don't want to create such a bleak picture. There's great things happening in Welland. But this is the story that you continue to, have to hear in the news and that we've had to live with. And it rips at your heart, it rips at the pride that you feel in your community, and it's hard to move forward, but we had to. The city of old had to find a new way, and I'm here to talk about that. It's interesting, I was reminded that the city's logo for the corporation of the city of Welland is where rails and water meet. An interesting ha thing happened in 1973. They moved the water. You see in the picture here on the right-hand side to the east is the bypass to the shipping canal, an important part of our, uh, our history, William uh, Hamilton Merritt building the canal uh, and delivering all of that to Welland. But in 1972, because of changes and, and volumes that were required in the shipping canal, the shipping bypass was built. Bypassing the city of Welland and leaving in its wake a 12-kilometer stretch of the most beautiful water we have between the Great Lakes. That 12-kilometer stretch is what we're using to try to reinvent our city, rebrand our city, not necessarily reinvent it, because we are still a, a great city. We just need to look at our assets and use them so that we can be better that we can be an economic uh, factor, we can provide jobs and quality of life. From 1973, when they closed, opened up the new bypass and, and closed the waterway, 25 years passed. We've heard a lot of people talk today about reports and studies and government and bureaucracy. Try 25 years of it. 25 years of report that sit in our boardroom and I've turned the labels backwards so that we never look at them again. We've taken all the ideas of, out of them. Don't get me wrong. There's great stuff in there. There's great work of many volunteers and boards and agencies. In 1997, the city of Welland was successful in being deeded the lands that are the waterways so that came into the city's control in 1997. So that's a 25-year journey. In 1998, 99, 2000, still, still some more talking, but in 2001, they formed the Canal Corporation, which is the corporation that I represent. And City Council gave them an agenda. It took them a few years, but in 2005, they turned the corner. The power boats and recreational use, the vision of what we were going to do with the canal started. And yes, we started with a plan. Not a report. Don't get me wrong. It's not another report. This is the one that's facing outwards on the shelf. But we started to plan what we were going to do with the waterway, talk to the community, talk to business people. What do we want to do with it? And part of it was, of the waterway was sport tourism and, and using it as a flat water sports venue and recognizing what, what could be done with it. The previous council in 2005 had supported the idea that we could use this venue as a sport course and they had identified Dragon Boat. 
And one of the things we talk about when we go back to the coal mining town and the lumber mill and the industry that was in Welland is the lack of diversification. And when I was brought on board, it's one of the first things that I recognized that in using this incredible national asset, because there isn't another body of water like it in Canada, this is the premier flat water venue destination in our country. It's the fairest water, it's the cleanest water. It is cleaner than a public pool, you can drink it. It's the source of our municipal drinking water. So to do all, of, to build that for just one sport doesn't make sense. So let's not fall into the same errors that we've done in the past. So we identified multiple sports, eight of them in total. Take a business approach to it. Let's go after sport tourism. It's a $600 billion industry globally. Let's go after it. How do we go after it? Well, we invited every regional, provincial, national, and international sport organization to come to Welland. And they quickly said on the phone, where? <laughs> we had our challenges. I said, Welland, we're in the heart of Niagara. Come on down. Come have dinner with us. And they did. We put them up in an airplane. And they all said, you want to do what? I said, we're going to put you up in an airplane, a six-seater. Flew out of the International Welland Airport. <laughs> we put them up in the air and we flew them over the waterway. And they went, wow. And we were all on the air, we could hear each other. We said, now turn to your right. And they saw Niagara Falls. And they said, wow. So now look out to your left. And they saw St. Catharines and Beamsville and Vineland and the wineries and the escarpment. And they said, wow. We had to prove to people and ourselves that Welland, our city, is in a world-class region. And we in the region itself, in our city, in our venue, is part of a world-class destination. We have so much to offer, and we need to work together to deliver it. We landed the airplanes, we had dinner, they went home, and the phone started ringing. Okay, we want to host. We had effectively put a banner up. We called it the Welland International Flatwater Center, and boldly, it didn't exist. So now what? Granted, in 2006, and people had been using it for rowing and, and for some canoe events, and so the ideas aren't necessarily new. It was what we were doing to promote it that was new. In 2006, there were eight events hosted in Welland at, on the water, but now it was a flat water center. 2011, we hosted over 30 events in that four short years. 30 events, 20,000 visitors. So that's what we've grown to become. And that's what sport tourism is all about. Those are the numbers that we needed. And I liken it because when we talk about economic impact, and we're going to define sport tourism in a second, 20,000 visitors over 60 days, migrating, moving to our community, staying overnight, eating, drinking, going to the movie, spending more money and exploring our region more than we do ourselves. How many people here haven't been to the walk behind the falls? How many people in this room haven't been on the rail care ride? Who hasn't been to Henry Pelham Winery? Who hasn't been to Shakespeare in the park or in the vineyard? When tourists travel, they do all those things. They affect the jobs. They have an economic impact. So if we had 20,000 visitors over 60 days, we'll do some math, you divide on this side, multiply on that side, that's 5,000 visitors over 240 days. Well, a college semester is 240 days. So we're the equivalent, and it's simple math, I get it, so don't take it too far, but we're the equivalent of a college. Why wouldn't you support a college? No one would ever say, let's not support the college in our town. So we're a 5,000 person college in our town? Even downgrade it. Say we're just a 3,000 person college. The incredible things that we're doing. So sport tourism defined, quite simply, everyone in this room, I, I, I can almost guarantee you, as has done something involved in sport tourism. Any sport, cricket, lacrosse, baseball, golf, rugby, canoe, kayak, dragon boat, rowing, open water swimming, triathlon. The moment you get in your car and off your couch to do something, you're impacting the economy. By definition, you have to travel 40 kilometers. You don't have to travel 40 kilometers just to compete, though. You could travel 40 kilometers to go to a clinic, to train. You could be an athlete, an official, a coach. You could be a spectator, you could be a fan, a father, a mother, anything that you do that's related to sport. That's why it's a $600 billion industry worldwide, globally. 
locally or nationally, it's a $3.6 billion industry. It is the fastest growing grassroots economic development that we have in Canada. One of the best things about sport tourism that I have found in my, in my years, of, it's five years now of, of working with it, is that we talk about the economic recessions and the downturns in tourism and we see all that's happening. But a common fact remains, people train to compete. So they have to. They don't care whether the competition's in St. Catharines, in Bangladesh, in the Philippines, wherever it is. They train to compete. Yes, at the world level, they're traveling all over the world, but even here locally, whether it's in London or the basketball championships or in Kitchener, we train, our kids go out, they practice to compete. So that volatility that we've seen in the tourism sector, the sport tourism side of it's a little bit less volatile. And it's absolutely incredibly diverse. This picture is from uh, Zeged Hungary, the senior world championships for canoe sprint. And I show it, it's a non-water shot. And I show it on purpose because people don't realize that sport tourism and event hosting, especially at this magnitude, affects so many people, so many jobs. There's media broadcast. There's event management. There's equipment rentals. There's manufacturing. There's engineers involved in putting this all together. Every spectrum, and factory jobs are incredible. People produce incredible things. They make a good, fair wage. Sport tourism, they think that you make $12 an hour or ten twenty-five, or just minimum wage. It's not the truth. It's not the truth. Sport tourism, a lot of words up there. A lot of different jobs, a lot of different professions. And yes, there's $10 an hour jobs. But yes, there's $70 an hour jobs. Graphic design, facilities, equipment, food service medical and doping, athlete services, and yes, tourism, that other part. Because when you go, I coined a phrase, I call it the sportcation, because at the last recession it was called the staycation. How about the sportcation? I know I've had the pleasure of traveling to London, England, the Henley on the Thames with my daughter. She was fortunate to race the Women's English Henley. What an incredible moment. But I know that when I was making the trip to, the, to London, to England, I knew I was gonna see London, it's a sportcation. So why aren't we working together as a region? And that's the key, and that's what we're starting to do, and that's what's happening, and that's why positive things are happening. People travel to compete. They want to leave incredible things. We have national athletes, we have a national asset here in Welland, and that's what we've tapped into. And it's an incredible economic impact. And one of the things we've had to do is teach people to believe in what we're doing. We work closely now with Niagara College, Brock University, because every one of these programs is happening at our educational institutions. And we're working together because we're one of the largest living labs for people to get experience so they can take it abroad or work right here. We have people that we now employ in our office that went to school elsewhere and are coming back to Welland to work. It's fantastic. We had to believe and get people to recognize in our community that we have that national asset. Every single Olympian that competes in one of the sports that I've identified comes to Welland. That's a proud moment. Every single Maple Leaf that is worn at the Olympics just recently, and flatwater sports are the most winningest sports in Canadian history in Summer Olympics. They come through Welland. That's fantastic. The Adam Vancouverdens, the Marnie McBeans, the Mark Oldershaws, the Mark DeYoungs. They're in our hometown. We have incredible partnerships. These are some of the recreational ones. So many organizations that we can touch because we diversified. We took our competitive advantage, which was the waterway, our unique selling property, and we're doing everything we can to leverage it to make a difference in our city. Some of the highlights that sport delivers, and we've touched on them. I'll go quickly over this slide. One of the underlying objectives of what we're trying to do is because you can't just do all of this and leverage what you're doing and ask the municipality behind it if you're not leaving community legacy. And I'm proud to say that I'm a partner with the Niagara Community Foundations and we have a flat water fund and please go out right now and donate to it or, or, or volunteer to it. We've been able to year over year now because of the events that we are hosting build the legacy that we had always planned to. It's because of the World Championships and the Toronto 2015 Pan American Games that we've just broken ground on a $10 million facility in Welland 
to build that thing that in 2006 we said, we're here. We are here. We are here, we're 30 events a year, but we're delivering 25 to $30,000 a year of community programming back to our community programs. That's a Big Brothers Big Sisters Day. Kids out on the water giving it a try, they've never been on the water before. Because those Olympians that are wearing the flags on their chest, the Mark Holdershaws, they could be sitting right beside you right now. If you grew up in Banff, Alberta, you learned to ski. If you grew up in Niagara, you should be learning a flat water sport. We have the greatest venue in the nation. We are now part of the city's strategic plan, part of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, and the city's economic plan. Recognizing that we are now a cornerstone of the future economy of the city 2.0. That's an uh, architect's rendering of uh, the new buildings, of an athlete center, community legacy portion that will drive sport tourism and the economy in Welland for years to come. The Henley is 130 years old. How tough to compete with the, hi the history. But I know that 130 years, I won't be here. Some marvel of medicine yet to be invented, but 130 years from now, there will be an event at the Welland International Flatwater Center. It is part of Cities 2.0. Over the next three years alone, with the World Championships that we're hosting in Dragon Boat, Canoe, uh, and Swimming, over $48 million in economic impact. And that's just from events. That's not from operations, that's nothing else. $48 million in events for the Niagara region and the city of Welland. And I am so absolutely proud to be a part of it. I thank you, and I hope that all of you will be at, uh, affected positively by sport tourism and uh, Cities 2.0. Here we go. <laughs>